up front, before I talk about why this is a supports-based um, uh, theory or in, in definition, I think it's important for your viewers to understand what is the definition. Uh, because this, this definition is one that is um, being used uh, throughout much of the world, and it is one that we anticipate will continue to be used because it does indeed reflect uh, current thinking. Uh, intellectual disability is characterized by significant limitations, both in intellectual functioning and in adaptive behavior, as expressed in conceptual, social, and practical adaptive skills. And the disability originates before the age of 18. Now, a definition is a definition. One of the things that we introduced in 1992 was that a definition does not stand by itself. Uh, you need to talk about the context from which that definition comes and also uh, how it should be applied. And so over the course of the 92, the 2002, and now the 2009 manual, uh, we have uh, promulgated a uh, series of assumptions that I think reflect uh, both where the definition comes from, but a strong recommendation as to how it should be applied. And I'd like to share those five assumptions because two of those assumptions deal directly with the concept of supports. The first assumption is that limitations in present functioning must be considered within the context of community environments typical of the individual's age, peers, and culture. And what that does is it contextualizes what is intellectual disabilities. Uh, in, in looking at intellectual disabilities internationally, there are different concepts because of culture and what may be a deficit in one culture is not viewed as a deficit in another culture. The second assumption is that valid assessment considers cultural and linguistic diversity as well as differences in communication, sensory, motor, and behavioral factors. And the reason why that assumption is so important is because individuals with intellectual disabilities frequently do have sensory, motor, and behavioral impairments of one kind or another, and consequently those must be taken in consideration uh, when one uh, assesses their behavior and also applies the definition of intellectual disabilities. The third assumption, which is also very important, is that within an individual, limitations often coexist with strengths. And I think that's one of the most unique parts of the definition and that is to view not just the defect of the individual, but also to recognize that within any individual, regardless of the, the degree of limitations, there are definite strengths that we need to build on. And now the two assumptions that deal with supports and make this a very unique definition. An important purpose of, decision limita of describing rather limitations is to develop a profile of needed supports. And the reason why that assumption is so critical is because very often people would just make a diagnosis and then that's the end of the process. And what we've tried to stress and do stress is that the diagnostic process must include the planning of individualized supports as a key part of that process. And then finally, as a fifth assumption, it is with appropriate personalized supports over a sustained period, the life functioning of the person with intellectual disability generally will improve. And, and the importance of that assumption, I think, is, is self-evident. And that is, again, it's a, a humanistic as well as a potential definition where you look at the strengths of the individual, not just the, the limitations, with supports being a key part of human functioning and the, uh, the level of human functioning. Well, the issue of classification really has both a historical uh, nature to it, but it also has a very pragmatic current nature to it. Historically, people have been diagnosed um, with intellectual disabilities or what's been called mental retardation or mental deficiency, and then have been classified based upon an IQ score. So historically, what you see then is uh, individuals who are classified as mild, moderate, severe, and profound, or moron, idiot, et cetera, based upon an IQ score. Now, with the 92 manual and, and reflected also in the 2002 manual and, and again in the 2010, the world is changing in reference to the kinds of questions that are being asked regarding people with intellectual disabilities. You know, we now are asking questions like, is this person competent to be a witness? Uh, is this person competent to be a, um, uh, a self-advocate? Is this person competent to parent? Is this person competent to have sexual relations? Uh, is this person competent to uh, have a bank account? So consequently, when, when competency comes into play, then the old historical notion of a classification of IQ really falls to the wayside. 
So beginning with the 92 uh, manual and continuing now through the 2010, what we have suggested is that since the questions are changing that we're asking of people, since the world is changing in terms of the expectations that we have for people with intellectual disabilities, then our classification system must indeed reflect that changing world. Now what we do in the 2010, consistent with the 2002, is that we have a multi-dimensional model of human functioning. And that multi-dimensional model of human functioning really looks at what we call the five dimensions of, uh, of human functioning. With intellectual functioning being one of the dimensions, uh, adaptive behavior being a second one, um, health being the third, participation, which means participating in activities and opportunities, being the fourth, and context being the fifth. And what we do then in the 2010, which we did not do in the 2002, is that we then propose a classification system that is based upon these multi-dimensionalities of human functioning. Well, and in that regard, one of the things that we, we do uh, in the 2010 manual is we really ask the question, why do you assess people? Followed by, why do you classify people? And chapter three in the manual has what we call an assessment framework. And we tie that into the issue of clinical functions. And there are really three major clinical functions in, in the world of intellectual disabilities. One is the diagnostic process. One is the classification process. And the third is the planning of supports. And so the point that we make is that these three processes or three uh, functions need to be aligned. That you diagnose for a purpose you classify for a purpose, and then you pr use that information to plan individualized supports. It's increasingly apparent that the definition of intellectual disabilities must include the concept of supports. And the reason why that is so critical is because the, the level of human functioning of any of us is directly related to the supports that we receive. And so consequently, taking it away from just the focus upon the defect that the individual has and looking at what is the potential of that person in regards to human functioning with appropriate supports, then you really have a complete system. And so uh, internationally, you see support employment, supported living, supported education. And the, the vehicle that has really allowed that whole alignment of the diagnosis and classification and supports process uh, has been the support intensity scale. And so you cannot simply take that definition in isolation. You must include the, the assumptions, two of which deal directly with supports. The point there is that what we want to, to see people do, which is a best practice, is to, to go beyond the world of diagnosis and to really understand not just the implications of your diagnosis, but also what needs to be done once an individual is diagnosed as an individual with intellectual disabilities. And that ties directly then, you use the support intensity scale. So the, and this comes into play as you look at the evolution and changes that are occurring in terms of, of the adaptive behavior concept. Historically, adaptive behavior as a concept and as, a measure, as it was measured was used to develop rehabilitation plans and goals for people, educational plans and goals for people, uh, not as a part of diagnosis. So since 1959 and, and certainly since 92, Adaptive behavior has become co-equal with intelligence in terms of the criterion for intellectual disabilities. But then we've taken the issue of supports and have used the support intensity scale as the vehicle to develop support plans for people that are based upon their support needs as opposed to their adaptive behavior. And so consequently, in individual program plans and in individual support plans, what is increasingly being monitored is not behavioral objectives, but individual support objectives to see whether or not that support is actually provided. Because we know that if the support's provided, the behavioral change occurs, as opposed to simply focusing upon the individual and the, and the behavioral objective related thereto.